The Northern Star newspaper had long been the object of government wrath. With the help of a defense team, including Samson and Kernan, it survived two separate pr prosecutions for seditious libel in 1794, for his advocacy, his anonymous reports of those trials, and his satirical writings. In that newspaper, Samson won a handsome silver urn, 18 inches high and beautifully inscribed, which I saw in the basement of the great-great-granddaughter of William Samson and Theobald Wolftone, Catherine Dickerson, who also held the private collection of letters which um, Marion mentioned. And this urn is a beautiful urn, uh, and it says, presented by the proprietors of the Northern Star to William Samson, barrister at law, in testimony of their approbation of his political principles and in gratitude for his disinterested ex exertions in favor of the freedom of the press. But Samson's endeavors for freedom of the press were not to cease. During this time, Samson also raised the ire of the government by authoring the strongly democratic Belfast resolutions. In January 1797, uh, in the interim, he had also published uh, another pamphlet called Advice to the Rich, warning that a rebellion might follow if reforms were not made. Clare, the Lord Chancellor, told the Irish House of Lords of the daring insolence displayed by the Belfast resolutions, which were of so treasonable a nature as to make us amazed at the mildness of government and not punishing the authors. And William Drennan, too, saw the danger. If I be the quietest man in, in Ireland, after his own conviction, um, Samson is certainly the most active that can leap upon a joint stool and harangue the populace at such a time, on such a topic, with such temper, and near such a body of military as were in the town. And I hear that had they waited another quarter of an hour, Colonel Barber would have broken up the meeting. Having refused to take up arms in support of the government, Samson, Emmett, and Curran would need all their hardihood of mind to resist what would come next when, according to Drennan, the nation would be obliged to choose between the dagger or the bow. From his prison cell, Samuel Nielsen succeeded in making arrangements for the Northern Star's continuance, and William Sampson remained one of the newspaper's principal contributors. A few months later, the castle instructed Colonel Barber, in charge of the military, to make a further raid, to seize types, machines, papers, and everything else, and to arrest all concerned with the paper. On February the 3rd, 1797, the brothers Sims, who were then in charge, were duly arrested and transported from Belfast to a Dublin jail. Despite the fact that its proprietors were in jail, its types confiscated, and the castle had refused to permit the registration of its new printer, the Northern Star reappeared a few weeks later. Its resurrection was brief. On May the 19th of 1797, while Samson's petition was circulating, and only a few days before the prohibited meeting in Down, a party of the Monaghan militia attacked the Northern Star offices without a warrant, gutting it and destroying its contents. With extreme satisfaction, General Lake reported that the soldiers did lay about them most lustily, and almost totally demolished the whole of the machines. This time, the Northern Star did not reappear. Some months later, William Samson defended William Orr upon a charge of high treason. After an extremely suspect trial, Orr was sentenced to death for having administered the secret oath of the United Irishmen in 1796 to a government informer. The execution after a rigged trial of Orr left a signal impression upon Samson. More than 30 years later, looking back on a long and eventful career in an address to a group of fellow exiles, Assembled to honor him, Samson asked only that they remember his name along with that of Orr. This execution in October 1797 and the publicity that surrounded it sparked off a huge and threatening controversy. Orr was a popular martyr, and his last words, remember Orr, became a powerful rallying cry. Orr's sorry fate soon led to the imprisonment of Peter Finnerty, one of the United Irish printers. Finnerty put out the press a Dublin radical newspaper which had taken over as the unofficial organ of the United Irishmen after the suppression of the Northern Star, which was considered one of the world's leading democratic newspapers of its day. Samson was a frequent anonymous contributor to the press as well as the Star. He acknowledged that many things indeed I did write for it, the whole of which I should have little hesitation to avow. 
at the time the press first appeared, he explained, been exposed by his residence in the country and the duties of his profession and of humanity to hear the grievances and injuries of the oppressed, Samson was confronted with shocking crimes against the people. In defiance of his private interest and at the risk of his personal safety, he felt compelled to have courage to express his honest indignation and at any ha hazard to vindicate the laws of God and man against them. Speaking for the furious Democrats on the trial of the Democratic printer, Peter Finnerty, Samson declared in court that the press was engaged in nothing more than repelling argument by argument, assertion by assertion, invective by invective, and that at a time when they have 100,000 armed men on the opposite side of the question and the press nothing for its defense but paper shot. Curran reminded the jury of recent events showing that the liberty of the press and the liberty of the people sink and rise together, and the liberty of speaking and the liberty of acting have shared exactly the same fate. Also in late 1797, Samson formed a society for obtaining authentic information of outrages committed on the people whose aim was to document irrefutably by sworn evidence the licentiousness of the military. He's showing a panoply of cause lawyering techniques which are extraordinarily far-sighted. He succeeded in bringing together a broad coalition ranging from Whiggish reformers such as Henry Grattan and George Ponsonby to ardent radicals such as Lord Edward Fitzgerald and Thomas Addis Emmet. Of this achievement, William Drennan from Belfast remarked that Samson is a compounder of parties here and thinks with some reason he is able to manage them all and what they are willing to do. Drennan gleefully described one occasion in which he saw Ponsonby and Curran, the parliamentarians, entering Samson's room at a time when Lord Edward Fitzgerald and the other militant United Irishmen were inside. Drennan relished the idea of Samson administering the revolutionary oath to the parliamentarians. I should not be surprised that he would put them up, and a ludicrous print it would make, Samson at a table with the book, and the contrasted visages of Ponsonby, Grattan, and Curran repeating the test of the United Irishmen, which one day they united with each other in the castle to ridicule, ridicule and reprobate. A great body of documents, ultimately over 300 sworn affidavits was collected from all parts of Ireland, proving the atrocious system then carrying on. These papers contained details of most horrible outrages on the people, cruelty and foul deeds. The masses were driven to desperation and retaliation by murder, burning, destruction of property, often on suspicion of being suspected, and flogging. They were invoked by reformers in both the Irish and the English House of Lords, and according to one plausible account, were even transmitted personally to King George III, without result. Dublin Castle was infuriated at its continuing failure to silence the radical voice. Samson went to the press offices at 62 Abbey Street, just a few doors from his home, where he found the military smashing the presses and types with sledgehammers and arresting the apprentices. The government's immediate object, Samson learned afterwards, was to prevent the publication of a letter by the Cork barrister, John Shears, attacking Clare. Of Samson's attendance at the deathbed of both the Northern Star and the press, Richard Robert, Robert Madden, the United Irish historian, commented that he seems to have been destined to have walked, watched over the cradles and walked after the hearses of all the democratic journals of his time. For his endeavor, Samson's reward was to be put under arrest. As he left the press offices with the printer's sister-in-law, a pile of ball cartridges burst out of her apron and scattered all over the floor. The militia declined to believe the ammunition was on the premises only to guard against attack. Samson was released on bail, but he was a marked man, and his reprieve was short. For his radical lawyering and for his prolific, although generally anonymous, political writings on social and religious equality, Samson became a marked man. A warrant was issued for his arrest along with the United Irish leaders on March the 12th, shortly before the 1798 rebellion broke out with belated and inadequate French aid. Samson went underground but was eventually captured, imprisoned, disbarred, and banished by act of attainder. Samson's name was among several for whom these warrants for treason were issued. On that fateful day, Emmett McNevin's sweet man and the two Jacksons were among 16 leading revolutionaries seized. When his lodgings were raided, Samson promptly took to his heels, as did Lord Edward Fitzgerald. 
Many of Samson's original papers documenting the military outrages were lost in his hurried departure. Some burned for fear of discovery. From his Dublin hiding place, Samson published open letters to the Lord Lieutenant and the Attorney General, offering to give himself up only if he was assured of a speedy trial or reasonable bail. He was prompted to do so by a sense of duty to a very great number of unfortunate prisoners who have entrusted the defense of their lives and liberties to me, and also because of his experience of hundreds imprisoned for months or years without trial, or any means of vindicating themselves, however innocent they may be. While Samson went underground, the country was proclaimed in a state of rebellion and martial law was declared. Samson kept very close confines, not attempting to go out of his lodgings, but at night time, you can imagine my, the thrill when I discovered the document of the person who harbored him in the state paper office and I learned this backstory, which is not published anywhere else other than th that manuscript. So he went out only at night time when he did so in disguise. And eventually, another United Irishman engaged a berth for Samson on a collier bound for England secretly. Samson was immediately detained on suspicion upon landing at Whitehaven in April of 1798. He was traveling under an assumed name, Samuel Williams, and apart from claiming he was going to Edinburgh on undisclosed business, was, according to the magistrates who interrogated him, altogether, altogether shy about answering interrogatories. This account contradicts another story that Samson was traveling disguised as a woman, but was captured when somebody spotted him shaving. His servant Russell carried a brace of primed and load loaded pistols and had ball cartridges in his pocket. Surprisingly, and this truly is a unique uh, instance, an ambiguous one, in light of Samson's undeviating claims of distance from the armed uprising, and my sense is that he really was a prisoner of conscience and nothing else, but there is this odd note, at least according to the magistrate's account, a message to one Thomas Gill, Sir, some time ago I wrote to Mr. James Robinson of Liverpool to forge you an order for five gross of musket swivels to be sent. Portland and Pelham were informed of the capture. The English magistrates who examined this mysterious stranger astutely observed that he seemed much agitated, uh, much agitated at first, and by his allusions to the dangers of false imprisonments, we judged him to be of the legal profession. Although Samson and Russell denied any relationship, the next day, under intense questioning on his own, the servant unwittingly revealed the identity of his master. Having made no previous arrangements for lying, admitted Samson, we were very soon taken aback. Besides, Samson's daunting reputation as a fugitive rebel had preceded him. The magistrate's suspicions were particularly aroused when they learned that their captive's house had been visited by Lord Edward Fitzgerald. To confirm their suspicions, the magistrates sent a description of their captive to Dublin Castle. He seems about five feet, nine inches high, has dark brown hair tucked up under a very fair two-curled wig, has thick, dark eyebrows, a clear, good hazel eye, a good face, strong and well-limbed, a thin beard, had on him a blue coat, red striped waistcoat, blue pantaloons and half boots, is evidently a gentleman and of good education. Some years later, in another passport issued to him, the French would add that Samson's features included a high forehead, a large nose, a middle-sized mouth, a round chin, and an oval face. While Samson was being imprisoned without trial, the rebellion of 1798 broke out with the estimated loss of 30,000 lives. Alarmed at the prospect that the Irish state prisoners might be banished to the United States, Rufus King, the uh, American foreign minister in London, warned Timothy Pick Pickering, the American Secretary of State, that their principles and habits would be pernicious to the order and industry of our people. And I cannot persuade myself that the malcontents of any character or country will ever become useful citizens of ours. And King, although he succeeded in persuading the Adams administration not to allow the Americans and uh, the, the United Irish come to America at that time. He presently president, he added that nowhere would the United Irish leaders be more mischievous than in the United States, where from the sameness of language and the similarity of laws and institutions, they have greater opportunities of propagating their principles than in any other country. King convinced the Adams administration to exclude the state prisoners from the United States. As one Irish government official dryly explained to the captives, Mr. King does not like to have Republicans in America. 
It was decided instead to banish Samson to Portugal, a rare European country that was not there at, uh, then at war with England. A couple of days after Wolf Tone's tragic death in his cell, the lovely Mary was ordered to sea against the will of its captain. Samson saw Ireland for the last time falling back into the heavy gales behind him. After a three-day battering by winds and waves, the lovely Mary was shipwrecked, a common trope in Samson's adventurous life, on the Welsh coast on November of 1798. And that very same day, Samson's name was struck off the list of barristers on account of his having been of a seditious and traitorous society of men, styling themselves United Irishmen and having confessed themselves guilty of high treason. You see here, this is the rolls and the King's Inns in Dublin where, uh, of course, the barristers are now trained. Um, and they keep this beautiful leather-bound book and that is the rolls, holding the names of, of all of the barristers. And he was struck off, this is the line through, through his name here. And it says, erased by order of the 27th of November, 1798. And uh, on the same order, uh, the same line, uh, I also found, of course, uh, Emmett, who was imprisoned, disbarred, the same arrest warrant, the same banishment act, and also the same disbarment from the Irish legal profession. Samson read of the event in the newspapers in the midst of many false reports about him, but felt it not worth arguing about. In a series of letters to Cornwallis and Portland, however, he vehemently challenged the assertion that he had confessed treason. He always said that the cr crimes were committed not by him, but by the government. Upon his arrival in Portugal, Samson and his long-suffering servant, John Russell, were mysteriously imprisoned once more in Lisbon. Always the romantic Samson amused himself by attempting to communicate with a young lady across the street in another cell, sending messages first with a homemade bow and arrows and later in a hollowed orange rind tied to a thread. Among the other prisoners were a French bigamist, a Corsican smuggler, and a Portuguese diplomat. Suddenly in early May of 1799, Samson and Russell were put on board a Danish dogger, misleadingly dubbed de Hoffnung, and board for Bordeaux. They eventually reached France in June 1799. In the French Republic, Fran Samson was greeted with a hero's welcome. The, municipal mun the municipality of Bayonne resolved to protect him as a victim of despotism, whose sentiments of liberty and the zeal with which he had asserted it in the midst of atrocious persecutions were the cause of his sufferings. It was also suggested by the French that Samson, so well known in the annals of Ireland, may be able to offer very useful instruction touching the situation of the enemies of France. Alas, said William Samson, the advocates of the poor are few and their reward is ruin. But Samson fared better than his dissident friends who were hanged. He described Ireland as my ill-fated country where atrocity leads to honor and virtue to the scaffold. After their rendezvous in Paris, where Samson's name was proposed as a United Irish ambassador to the French government, he and some other exiled comrades made their way to New York City. Upon landing on American shores, these United Irish exiles both figuratively and literally left behind the colonial world and entered the post-colonial post world of Jeffersonian New York City. In early 1806, New York City's Irish Catholics, as we have learned, demanded of the State Assembly in Albany that they be put on the same formal footing of religious freedom and, and political equality. They uh, requested the benefits of the free and equal participation of all the rights and privileges of citizens that were guaranteed to them by the state and federal constitutions and complained that it was frustrating to have the cup of equalized rights dashed from their lips by the test oath which was still in place. Mayor DeWitt Clinton, um, as we have learned, introduced the bill to, to abolish the test oath in New York State, and despite vigorous Federalist opposition, this Emancipation Bill comfortably passed so that Catholics were allowed to sit in the State Assembly a full generation before Daniel O'Connell's agitation achieved the same result across the Atlantic Ocean. The Jeffersonian American citizen applauded the outcome, saying that religion is most prosperous when it is most free. For Samson, after a voyage of seven weeks, he landed in the New World on July the 4th of 1806. He immediately addressed an open letter to Lord Spencer, the Lord of the Admiralty in, in London, 
um, and later published it in his memoirs in which he declared himself grateful to the British government for past favors. He described the Americans celebrating their liberty by singing Republican songs and drinking revolutionary toasts. I was in expectation that the Lord Mayor would have brought the military and fired on them, declared Samson in mock surprise. But the mayor is not a lord. And I, I was informed that he was seen drinking with some of the soldiers. The Americans were making an outcry about a sailor killed off by an English captain. It is a pity we had not them in Ireland. We might have 10,000 of them shot in a day and not a word said about them, Samson said to Lord Spencer. He also claimed to be frustrated in going to the barracks to inform against the demonstrators because there was no barrack. The soldiers live in their own houses and sleep with their own wives. William Sampson learned that his disbarred friend, Thomas Addis Emmett, had re regained admission to practice without waiting for his United States citizenship. Sampson, too, was lucky. While staying at Ballstown, the springs in upstate New York, the Supreme Court of Judicature of the state of New York held a sitting in nearby Albany. Despite gloomy predictions from his friend, Sampson impressed a notable bench enough to win back his license. But these warnings were not misplaced. Immediately after approving Samson's application, the court ordered that in future, only United States citizens would be admitted to practice law in New York State, a rule which stayed in place until the 1970s, when it was overthrown by the US Supreme Court, incidentally. As Samson put it, the court, after admitting me, made a rule to admit no other strangers under similar circumstances. The door, however, was not shut until I had contrived to walk in. Nevertheless, as he jubilantly declared after eight years in exile, I have now a profession at my back once more. With this narrow entry into practice, the banished United Irishman would emerge as perhaps the first career human rights lawyer known to history and as perhaps its first radical post-colonial legal theorist. A year after his arrival, Samson published his memoirs recounting his adventures from 1798 to 1806. They appeared at the end of a turbulent year that saw Emmett successfully rail against federalist royalist principles in the spring elections, um, popular outrage against British impressment of sailors into its navy and the, the imposition of the embargo. The prevalent anti-English feeling generated by these events undoubtedly contributed to the great success of Samson's memoirs, which Samson wrote as a denunciation of British policy in Ireland. This letter is one uh, addressed to his wife. It's today dated in July 1806. It's from the collection of letters which are mentioned in the possession of the descendants common to him and Wolf Tone. Uh, these eight years he was separated from his wife are, for me as a historian, a wonderful trove because these letters to his wife are very different from his other correspondence with figures such as Thomas Jefferson. These contain very detailed and personal uh, accounts of his daily life. I'll just give you this as an example. And of course, you know, the search for these materials and even deciphering the handwriting. If you choose a project like this, try and find somebody who has good handwriting that helps a lot. <laughs> Uh, another picture of Samson, and then these are the memoirs I just mentioned, and the title says it all, Memoirs of William Samson, including particulars of his adventures in various parts of Europe, his confinement to the dungeons of the Inquisition and Lisbon, etc., etc., several original letters being his correspondence with the ministers of state in Great Britain and Portugal, a short sketch of the history of Ireland, particularly as it respects the spirit of British domination in that country, and a few observations on the state of manners, and etc. in America. <laughs> this is uh, the second edition. Um, it went through, uh, uh, at least, it went through three editions, and um, lately it has been noted that it is actually occupies, uh, Samson has emerged as a, a very significant literary figure, particularly when you put these various anonymous works together, and. This is being noted more and more. And recently, uh, a writer, on a, a, a literary critic uh, in Ireland, has put this volume. Uh, it's, he's given it pride of place in what he calls the Irish Gothic tradition, which, of course, includes Sheridan Le Fanu and, and Bram Stoker and others. They, it has, these, these memoirs are an amazing read. They have this Kafkaesque sense of doom, but it's laced through with this, uh, this sarcasm and wit, which makes it uh, a very, very readable, um, wonderful literature.